really great subjects don't come along that often as a documentary filmmaker. And this clearly had the dimensions of a great subject. For one thing, because there's this, uh, the myth and reality element is so vast. You know, the myth of who they are, who, what, and it's the great, you know, it's the great American taboo. You know, communism is the most knee-jerk kind of <laughs> negative reaction you could have. And then there's the reality of not only really wonderful people, but a, a very big movement that made a lot of changes. during pre-production, to what extent did you formulate the content and the form or the structure of the film and, and what was the process that you went through in the early phase? This is the first film we've ever had any money to make, right? We made three documentaries on, the first one was $2,000, the second one was like $13,000, the third one was about $11,000, Union Maids. No money at all, really, to do anything with just the basics. We raised, very early on, we lucked out under the Carter administration and got a $160,000 grant. Now, you know, this is, you know, this is like, how do we, I mean, we were just stunned. And so we had the sense, first time, first time, I think any time, first time a filmmaker gets a real budget to work with, you tend to think it goes on forever, <laughs> I have to say. So we thought, wow, you know, we can just, we can try all the things we want to try. We can get the best possible archival footage. If we want to shoot 20 rolls on an interview, Let's do it, you know. Um, if we want to shoot a lot of characters and then throw them away later. So in a way, our normal style of working before had been to very, very, very carefully pre-plan because we had so little footage, right? Uh -huh. And to pretty much lot decide ahead of time what the shape of the film was going to be, what the structure of the film was going to be. So with Seeing Red, we didn't so much decide ahead of time what our position was going to be. Explain a little bit more about the importance of creating a story or a drama within a documentary. I think dr documentary films have to have some kind of a dramatic structure, have to tell a story. You have to choose the story you're going to tell and tell it well and make sure that every single thing in the film follows that, you know, is, going, is leading toward the end of the film, is taking you down that path. You, you don't have much time in a film to go off on a lot of side things. I don't think you do. I think people don't realize that. Another thing I think people don't realize about documentary films is that the amount of information you can put even into an hour and a half film information now I'm talking about, is maybe like you'd put in a short magazine article. That's all you can do. Film is not that wonderful at communicating information and analysis. It's good at developing character, I think, but it's not that good. So people who, who you know, wanted us to have all these vast numbers of facts and points of view represented, I think that's pretty unrealistic. Here's what happens. Somebody made a film. Somebody decided to investigate certain questions. They took a certain path. There were things they did. There were things they couldn't do. Um, there were questions they asked, there were questions that they didn't ask, but they took a particular path and this is what they came up with. Could have taken a different journey, could have ta asked different questions, but they didn't. And that's why at the beginning we, you, you see me on the phone, you see there's a whole process, you see a huge stack of contacts. It demystifies what you're seeing up there on the screen. And I think radicals need to do that. I think films have a real potential to be kind of fascistic. You know, you get everybody in a dark room looking forward and the voice of God comes on and tells you how to interpret the images and tells you the history or tells you the truth or whatever. I, I just really object to that. So that's why I'm in there also. We always felt from the beginning um, that this, pr this film uh, needed a kind of a, a bridge between the communists, sort of the evil other, the people we've never met before, and the audience, that it was a pretty far jump to make. So that we felt we needed a bridge and that I could be that bridge and I could be asking the questions that the audience had. And it was we felt it was important that you hear a lot of the questions. I think the initial idea for the film that we had was, was even much broader than the way the film turned out. You know, there's a lot of times you, you envision something much grander and then when you get into it, for one thing, you, you then can see the outlines of the real story underneath all this mass of information that you collect. The real story begins to emerge. You, know, you kind of totally immerse yourself in facts and in interviews and in all the stuff and you get over your head and then you kind of look around and say, where's the story here? Kind of like, where's the way out? And the story takes shape. The, the actual story that I described to you, those sort of four acts, the flowering of the youth, the attack, the crisis from within, and then who are they today, that four acts, we didn't have that. We always talk about the battle for perspective. It's one of the big battles that a filmmaker goes through, to be able to stand back far enough from what you're doing to see it with fresh eyes. And it becomes increasingly difficult to do that as you're staring at the same interviews month after month, right? You have to, in a way, divorce yourself from the fact that you were there when the interview was shot. You know what I mean? You have to sort of like, okay, forget what I was trying to do. Forget how I felt about the person, you know, et cetera. 
and just deal with what I have on screen. We interviewed 21 people and we only 15 are in the film. We really did not select them based on their political perspective. I mean, we didn't think, oh, well, we don't want to have anybody who says that. We wanted people who were good storytellers. And we also wanted people who could articulate uh, more on an analytical level. Say, someone like Bill Bailey is an incredible storyteller, but he's not, his, his strength is not in, in analyzing the mistakes of the party, let's say. Marge France is not the world's greatest storyteller, but she's very clear analytically, and she knows how to put across ideas very well. Could you talk a little bit about how you selected locations for the interviews and for the sequences? In other words, locations, the set, the scene, the lighting, the camera angles, and yeah. what comes to mind is some of the scenes that maybe were candlelit or by the fire, right, right. where the, the way the scene is shot really controls the mood of, right. of what's right. coming across. Like, I like deep backgrounds in an interview, where you, know, you kind of get a sense of the person's space and little details about who they are. The whole interviews against a bookshelf or a white wall are just awful, I think, just awful. You can communicate a lot about a person from where you set them. I think you want to be true to the actual situation. But sometimes the way something actually looks in the particular frame you have doesn't give you a sense of the whole. So you need to kind of bring in some of those other elements and put them there. You know how you can cheat, you can pull a chair out from the wall so the person's not bang up against the wall, you get a nice deep background. If the camera was able to see 360 degrees all the time, sure, but it's not. You know, we only get to see like this much. So we have to think about how can this much really say this much, as much as we can. At the beginning, we always shot two angles. And we always had it carefully planned, like we're going to start from this angle, and then we're going to go to this side angle. And then at this question, we're going to come back to this angle. And we're going to, you know, we kept, and all the early interviews are shot that way from two angles. Which I think was the idea was to make it visually more interesting. And we'd set up a beautiful kind of profile, just perfectly lit, and a beautiful front shot. And we'd spend hours lighting. We always spend hours lighting anyway, I guess you do. Um, then we completely cut that out. Because in editing, it was a real problem, you know, to have those. It, occasionally it worked for us. Occasionally it would be a perfect cut, you know, between the front and the side shot. Great. But mostly it was just clutter. It was just confusing. So we came to just choose a nice, like we're doing here, you know, a fairly nice straight on shot and just shoot the whole thing from that. Usually we did three sittings with people. And we realized after a while that if we broke it, um, to make best use of their energies and their sort of emotions. If we broke it so that we dealt with their, sort of their early, the youth, you know, what made them want to join the party, what kind of organizing work did they do, um, all those early things. If we did that in the morning, right, with light streaming in the window and they just had a cup of coffee and they're ready to go, that would work well. If we did the interviews about the sort of darker, more emotionally difficult section, which is the McCarthy period, and the Stalin revelation, certainly, if we did that at night, for one thing, visually, you, know, you have the shadows and the kind of, you know how, you, if you notice, the film does move from light to dark a lot, the interviews do. And I think that works for the audience. It also works for the subjects, though, because, you know, after dinner, you know, they, you're more likely to sort of sit back and be reflective and let your emotions kind of come to the surface a little bit more. Sometimes we'd have a glass of wine with dinner, you know, which is often a good idea. Um, and then when we dealt with them today, we try to get them to what they're doing today, like Dorothy Healy in the radio station. Could you say something about how you would deal kind of with preliminary interviews to the real interview in terms of people's spontaneity or being relaxed? Uh, did their stories start to get canned if they repeated them too many times? You, you do have this problem of you canned story. You know, you, you do have that problem. And one thing we try to do is make sure that the preliminary interview and the filmed interview were pretty far apart in time. I always tried to see these as conversations rather than as interviews, so that I wasn't just reading off my questions. You know, I was trying to respond to them. I always say that a good, an, a, an important question is often just a question like, why not? Or why? Is that right? Would you tell me a little bit more about that? You know, I mean, just, just to kind of get a person relaxed and keep me talking, let them know you're interested. So I'm good at sort of drawing out people who are nervous. I'm not as good. When somebody is um, withholding and not really giving us much, I'm, I'm not that good at getting them going. And so Jimmy will sometimes rip off the earphones. He does this very dramatically. It's really cool. Pull off the earphones with this dramatic flair and say, come off it. I mean, they'll start off something like that, you know. I don't believe this at all. I mean, you're, but, you know, whatever. And he'll come in from a completely other point of view and almost a little angry. And these people who are like this, particularly men, will be like this, you know. 
will just sit right up and really get engaged. You know? And he was very good be from behind the earphones at realizing when it was getting boring. As we do a lot of warm up, you know, these little tricks like you do, you have 15, 20 minutes of warm up questions that you just don't care what they answer just to get them relaxed so they can stare at the lights for a while and get used to them. You let them look through the camera. Another thing you can do is, well, you have to give the, pe you have to really give people a tremendous amount of energy when you're interviewing them, right? So that you, and try to ask questions in a little bit different way and lead them into it in a little bit different way. We sometimes would try to use music, poetry, journals, letters, anything to kind of settle in a mood. Sometimes we saved um, some of the hard questions. We never asked them in preliminary. Once we decided a person was going to be good for the film, sometimes we'd say, well, you know, let's not ask them this big question about the Stalin revelations until the actual interview. You know, we know they're going to be good on this, 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 and this, so we'll save these two questions and we'll, you know, and to kind of catch them off guard a little bit or get a fresh response. We said you guys were, as, as we can see it, you were some of the smartest people of your generation. You challenged everything. You had the foresight to challenge the whole capitalist system. Um, you challenged the way you were brought up, you, you know. But then, when it came to challenging your own movement, you know, and thinking, I mean, you know, challenging Stalin, you, you didn't, you never did it. You just kind of, well, how, how is that possible? And he had never heard that question no. before. And, you know, he just, he just looks at me for a long moment and then he kind of says, I don't know, I'm embarrassed that I didn't. I don't have, a, I really don't have an answer for that. I'm ashamed. We've talked a bunch about the interviewing yeah. process that you went through. Talk a little bit about the archival research process and kind of what right. you went through. I had had some experience on my own of doing archival research because I'd done it for union mates. And so I knew the archival houses the National Archive and the Library of Congress, at least, I knew of the commercial houses. So we hired Martha Olson, who had had not a lot of experience, but, you know, some experience. I, I also was a red diaper baby, so I had a great commitment to the ideas of the project, lived in Washington, D.C., um, hired her, and she worked for us uh, for two years, mostly full-time for two years uh, doing archival research. How much did you end up spending on archival? The National Archive. Is, do, is royalty free, and they have vast, vast collections, wonderful. Then all the other houses, it's a lot, it's like, uh, I mean, I remember prices like $500 a minute, you know, $1,000 a minute, that kind of thing. To discuss a little bit about the crew, I'd like to know uh, what your crew consisted of, how many people, what tasks they perform, and what kind of division of labor, how did right. you work together? I think it's very important that the crew um, share the goals, share your goals, understand what they are, and are kind of in it together. I think if they feel included, if they feel their thoughts are important to you, their responses are important to you, they're going to work better. They're going to know more what you're, what you're doing. So we did do that. We would sit around a lot and talk about how interviews went and what we, what we should have done and so forth, and talk about the all-over goals of the film and stuff. And we always hired people who were, pretty much, who were political, political people who were interested in the subject. Were you out in the field as the uh, controlling director saying do this do that or how did you actually call the shots in the field because I know one problem is when crews go out and attempt to work in a collective way right. sometimes you have kind of a lack of decisiveness yeah. and you right. need to be decisive often. Yeah. We had a system rigged up uh, like a, a beeper system you've probably heard that where the person gets a beep like one beep means roll and two beeps means cut which was secret to the people being interviewed and I would have my hand down over here signaling roll and cut so that um, I wouldn't have to be constantly saying to him, Roland, you know, I could just be talking to the person and, the ca and be able to, to communicate to the camera person. Now, the camera person, we always let, told him, look, if you, if you want to keep rolling, you sense there's something happening here, go with it. You know, um, and you can start, any t if you want to start, go ahead. I mean, he could override my signals. I made that real clear to him. So he wasn't just a, a mechanic, you know, pushing a button. So basically, the actual crew on site consisted of Steve, jo Steve, Judy, me, and Jim, four people, with no backup support. I mean, no PAs, uh, no production manager, nothing. Okay, so Judy, and Steve argued with us about this. He said, you're, you, you know, this is not right. Judy's going to be doing the job of two or three people, or you are going to end up doing the job of two or three people. You as the directors are going to run your asses ragged um, and not get to what you need to do. Well, we couldn't see that. We, we believed in small crews. We believed that, you know, we should be more egalitarian and not kind of divide up our work too much. Um, we also didn't think we could afford to pay more people. Um, 
but what it, but Steve was absolutely right. I mean, when it was time, like when lunch needed to be gotten, who was going to go get the lunch? Judy's ACing, she's loading magazines. I'm frantically calling people for the next interview and arranging sites and stuff because I don't have any help. You know, Steve's not going to go out and get the lunch. He's a union cameraman. What okay. approach did you take to beginning post-production? Did you begin to edit in the early phase of production? And then how did you organize the rough cut material? You sync up your rushes, you get them back. You look at them. I think it's always very important to look and look and look at your rushes before you start cutting. You know, that you really kind of absorb the material and that you, you leave enough pause between when you shoot your stuff and when you begin to edit it. If you can, I mean, if you're working on an extreme deadline, you can't. And we did transcribe verbatim uh, every, every interview, both sync and non-sync. We spent a lot of money. We have a, I mean, I have a stack like this, of trans, about like this, of the transcribed interviews. They run anywhere from 20 to 40 pages. I mean, per setting, you know, and some people had two and three settings. Um, we then marked what was sync, obviously, with a, with a certain kind of a black pen. We marked what was sync, and a lot of it's, of course, non-sync. Um, okay, then we do what we call, we, we make then selects roles. We take, you know, maybe a six-role interview and we edit it in half. You know, putting together just good material. You know, leaving out the weird heads and tails and also leaving out stuff that just didn't work and just making a select roll of all the good stuff. And we mark that in and say green. This is on the select roll. So we know now that what's in green is on the select roll. What's in black is on the then the outs roll. It became the outs roll. We didn't have a clear storyline we were trying to illustrate. But we did have to deal with the filmmaker's reality that we don't have good material on everything. You know, we only had good material on certain things. You know, some people, you know, like this. You know, I'll answer some questions well and other questions I won't answer well. And you, even if you want something I don't answer well, you aren't going to use it because it's no good. That's just a fact, right? All these people might want us to have people talking about things, but if they didn't talk about them well, we couldn't use it. But that was very much part of our learning process, was to do those interviews and take them back home and edit them and realize, oh, God, this isn't working. Or, geez, we should have asked them about this, you know. Why didn't we ask them about this? And one particular moment that's really quite wonderful is... Um, I forget the woman's name, but where she says, yeah, I was the uh, section organizer's wife and I was admitted right. to the party because they needed someone to take the notes. Right. And I think the viewers were just stung by that statement right. and then it just kind of leaves us hanging because everyone right. kind of smiles and goes on from there. We have two roles that never got in the film. One was racism and one was sexism. All the takes we had, all the different statements we had about those two issues, n and most of it didn't get in the film. Yeah, I think it would have, been, would have been a better film if we could have talked about how the party dealt with racism, the, the struggles it waged in the outside world, the struggles it waged inside, the same with sexism. And we had a lot and a lot of women who talked about the kind of secondary role they played and how every year on International Women's Day they would, you know, trot out there, yes, we're going to fight male chauvinism, but it didn't mean that much, ultimately. Uh, we had a lot of stories. Boy, did we ever have a lot of stories about sexism. Yeah, I know, it's just, there's just like two little statements about that in the whole film. And I thought I was doing good work. I mean, I was the leader of our youth, you know, organization. And, uh, but they concentrated on my brother. They weren't recruiting any woman. So there they took no my... The there was one woman. She was the section organizer's wife. Where would we have put it? The film's 100 minutes. It barely does deals enough with Stalinism, in my opinion, and the lack of democracy. It barely deals enough with that. Um, I just think it would have been too much of like an add-on to just then throw in and to have any kind of real discussion of sexism or racism in the party, it's like a 10-minute section. Mm -hmm. Where would we put it? We tried very hard to get a black woman to be in the film and not Sylvia Woods because she'd been in Union Mates. Um, we interviewed many people. None of them would agree to do it. I think it's because there's like that triple oppression. They're black, they're women, and they're ex-communists or they're communists. And, and I think coming out like that would just be difficult. But I just think there's a lot of reasons why a third world person would be afraid to admit they're a communist. It's bad. It was hard enough to get white people to admit to being communists. We didn't make the film for the historians, and we didn't make the film for the red diaper babies, and we didn't make the film for the ex-party people. We wanted their input. We were concerned that we not sort of somehow violate something or co come off completely off base to what their experience was. And we didn't want to be completely historically inaccurate. So we were concerned about those people, but we were, I have to say, a little bit more concerned about the average Americans who we wanted to come to the theater and see the film knowing nothing about it, having all the anti-communist feelings probably, and that we could have them see the world from the perspective of these people. And I feel very proud that we, very proud that um, the, the audience, the audience that most I think really likes the film and gets 
the most out of it. It's the most really eye-opening experience is, the, is that audience, not, of not the cognoscenti at all, but the regular folks who, who go see it. That's, that helps me weather all some of this sort of nitpicking, infighting, left-wing criticism, because I know that the film works for you know, really millions of people.